Is it nine? Nine oh five. All right. Good morning. It's nine oh five. I was told here. Lost track of time. Sorry. That's all right. We're catching up on the week, right? Fellowship. Be good to see you here this morning. Uh, this is the Sunday before Christmas. It's, that's really hard to, to believe, but it is. It's true. And uh, we're going to uh, get into the story of Ruth here as we've been looking at the mothers of Jesus. Kids, you're dismissed to junior church. Uh, Miss Tara is in the back there. And uh, you can go to junior church and help us there as well. Uh, good to see you again this morning. And uh, we got a little snow and maybe if it doesn't warm up too much and rain too much, maybe we'll have some for Christmas. Who knows, right? Hey, uh, just a couple of things to remind you of before our scripture reading and then our, our prayer before we get into the text. Um, if you have uh, members, if you received a, uh, a sheet there uh, about deacons and suggestions for deacon nominations based on the character qualifications, go ahead and fill those out and put them in the basket on the table. Um, there are some extra sheets there if you uh, didn't get one or you uh, lost yours. That would be very helpful for uh, us to uh, consider here for deacon um, uh, nominations. And then also uh, on the back of your bulletin is a list of addresses here of ways you can be a blessing to some of our people here who are recovering from health uh, issues and, um, and that haven't been able to get out. And so I, I know that that would be a huge blessing and honestly it's something that we all want to do and we think we're going to do, but you actually have to be intentional and do it. So make some time this week, maybe with your kids. If you got kids, sit down and have them color some pictures, make some cards, write a note. Um, the addresses are there in the back. I finally got through to Eddie here at Windward Gardens. And uh, it was very difficult to get through. Tried numerous times, but we had a good conversation. Uh, it's difficult there. Uh, he's... Uh, he doesn't quite understand everything that's, 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 that's going on, and um, he's, uh, he's discouraged uh, in some way, so it would really be good to, to send Eddie a note. Eddie is one of those people who uh, has just been so faithful over the years and through many health struggles, uh, makes efforts uh, far beyond what many of us physically healthy uh, uh, do, and so he's, he's, he's been a blessing. I think when we first moved here, one of the first things Eddie did, because Eddie has a, a, a thumb that's greener than my shirt, here this morning is say, hey, you want to learn how to, how to garden or grow a garden? I got some, you can have a, you know, like three or four rows of my garden, and you can do this and that, and I'll show you what to do, and, and uh, coached us through that. That, by the way, it was also my first introduction of black flies <laughs> on a, a significant level there. Rototilling <laughs> there after after rototilling uh, with hands exposed during black fly season and the next uh, night and morning my hands being swollen I learned my lesson and wore gloves uh, the rest of the time there. Um, we're going to have Josh come. He's going to read the scriptures here from the book of Ruth. A fascinating story um, and uh, points us to the Savior in unusual ways. Um, not the ways that you and I would have planned but the ways God's planned. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see you all here as you're turning to uh, Ruth chapter 1. <clears throat> We're going to start in verse 8. I'll pre-apologize for butchering any names. We're going to read uh, Ruth 1, 8 through 17, and then we're going to read Ruth uh, chapter 4, 9 through 22. So Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 8. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dad and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said to them, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, 
If I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they have grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. And then we'll turn over to Ruth 4, starting in verse 9. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have brought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Shilon's and Molon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren, and from his position at the gate, you are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, that you may prosper in Epaphrath and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor woman gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Abimadad. Abimadad begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Let's pray. Father, we are here today in this week leading up to our celebration of your birth, your son's birth, and we are uh, grateful for that birth, Father, that you made a way to restore relationship with our broken humanity, that you sent a savior to take our place, um, to um, cure the penalty of our sin. Father, we're amazed when we read through this book that out of um, a seemingly broken line out of ashes, you brought forth uh, the seed that would um, come, the promise that would come. We're grateful that you keep your promises uh, despite what we may think of the circumstances, your promises remain true, and you will, you will do what you say you've done. So, Father, help us to rest in that. We pray that you would give um, Jamie boldness as he preaches. Um, help him to speak clearly what you've laid on his mind. Open our hearts, open our minds. Father, help us to be drawn to the gospel um, through this season. And, Father, help us to spread this gospel as we have opportunity. And we will thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen.
you ever play that game where you see a picture of something zoomed in really close and you try to guess what that particular picture is? Maybe it's zoomed in on a certain part of a penny and you don't know what in the world that is and you just see that like so up close and microscopic and then you're trying to guess what it is and some of you smart ones figure it out but the rest of us are kind of stumped and then it zooms out and then you see the penny and you're like, oh, that's what it is. That's Lincoln's nose there in the, uh, in the, uh, in the picture. You know what it is, you go, ah. And then you can never look again at that zoomed in pic at the same way as you did when you saw the bigger picture. The details make sense. Which of those two pictures, the zoomed in one or the one zoomed out, is how we tend to interpret our day-to-day -day life? What would you say? The zoomed in, right? We get caught up with the details, right? We don't see significance to it. It just seems very ordinary and mundane, doesn't it? A lot of times. What's the meaning of the ordinary details of your day? How many of you enjoy the film It's a Wonderful Life? How many of you can't stand it? I know there's a certain small subset of you, and I won't, under, I won't understand you. The whole point of that movie is the significance of a life, right? And the spider webbing and the connections that our lives have and impact other people. But he couldn't see that, could he? That's the point of the movie. And so Clarence the Angel comes along and helps him see that. What's the meaning of the ordinary, ordinary details of your day? This week, the Harrisons walked through a very difficult trial. The prayer meeting Wednesday night, the Harrisons were there, and Archer was there with the youth group, and everything was normal. The next morning, he couldn't stop vomiting. He was confused and disoriented. Couldn't tell his own name. And went to the ER on a very snowy day. Difficult travel. Had some tests done. Some anti-nausea medicine. And then, concerned for his progression, they ordered a scan and did a scan of his brain and saw a mass on his brain, possibly. Difficult. You imagine the worst. Life can change in a minute, can't it? And so, Thursday, Friday, Friday really was a day where they said, hey, you need to go to Maine Medical in Portland and get some more expert opinion on this. And after some closer looks and more details, doctors at this point are thinking it could have been a really extreme migraine, which we're hoping is good news. Still waiting for some final tests, right, Greg? Things, confirmations and stuff. He should be coming out today. Should be coming out today. Yeah. As I visited with Greg on Friday, we were weeping because of the unknown details. And by the end of the day, we were rejoicing. Though nothing's been confirmed yet, and we're hoping that's what the doctor's leanings are. Life can change in a moment. Ordinary details. What's the meaning of the ordinary details of your day? That's the book of Ruth. One of the shortest reads in the Old Testament. You can read it in about 15 minutes. I said last Sunday, and I'll say it again. If your gospel does not need the Old Testament, it's not the gospel of the apostles. I'll share why that's true later on. There's a well-known preacher, Andy Stanley, who recently talked about how Christians need to unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament. We don't need the Old Testament here in our dealings with the gospel. 
What a sad statement. We just need the New Testament, he said. Now. There's a theme that runs throughout Scripture, and it's a story, the gospel is a story that builds up. It's connected. There's a backbone here that builds through the scriptures here, and it's this concept of a descendant, a seed. You remember how it begins, and go with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, after the, uh, the, the, the decision by Adam and Eve to rebel against God. In Genesis 3, 15, the curse, the Lord says to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, it shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And then you go to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And the Lord, out of all the nations, chooses one man, Abram. And he says, The Lord said to Abram, Get you out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curses you. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed or be a descendant from Abraham. By the time you get to the end of Genesis, you find out that Abraham has had a son named Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. And God chooses Jacob to be the father of Israel. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Jacob has 12 sons. And out of one of these sons is going to be someone who rules as king. And in Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 12, Jacob on his deathbed is blessing Judah. And he says this, Genesis 49, 8, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you are gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Until Shiloh come, and to him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his foal to the vine, and his ass's colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. Picture of a conquering king. And this concept of seed gets developed again, where in Numbers chapter 24. And verse 7, in the story of Balaam, God says <clears throat> this, He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Talking about one who comes with a scepter. <clears throat> and so you get to the book of Ruth, and right in the very first verses of Chapter 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Israel is in the promised land. They've crossed over. But Israel has gone after the things of the Canaanites. And God appointed some, some deliverers for Israel when the enemies would take over and oppress Israel. And he called them judges. And those judges ruled about 300 years. And so about 1,300 years, 1,300 B.C., before Christ comes, the book of Ruth tells the story of Naomi, a Moabite widow Ruth, and a farmer Boaz. A story plucked out of the annals of history that unless we knew, we, would have no, we wouldn't say, well, that doesn't really have any significance. And there's four chapters in this book that are designed and they're, they're very symmetrical. And the first and last chapters that Josh read some of those clips from reflect how loyalty in God's hand turns a story of tragedy and death into a story of joy and birth. And then those two chapters in the middle, two and three, in the middle of that sandwich here, show how Naomi and Ruth make this plan, and God honors that plan, and there, it's followed by an encounter between Ruth and this guy Boaz, and then, of course, followed by Naomi and Ruth rejoicing. Curiously, God is hardly mentioned in the book of Ruth by name, and Ruth has very little dialogue and conversations in here of actual words. And there's a time, at this time here in the, in the Judges, when we look for God to be active through a judge like Samson or Othniel or, or Jephthah or Gideon, right? Or a king, God instead works out his will through everyday faithfulness 
and unfaithfulness in God's people. And this not only benefits Naomi and her family, but it goes on to bless the world through the family of David, the line through which the Messiah would come. And we today sitting here are recipients of that. Here's kind of the flow of the book here. Naomi and her family, her husband and their two sons, they go to Moab during a time of famine. What do you know about Moab? Moab was a nation born out of the incest between Lot and his two daughters. <coughs> One of his daughters. And Naomi's sons marry Moabite women. That wasn't God's plan. And it gets even worse because Naomi's husband and her two sons die in Moab, not the promised land. They're buried in the dirt in Moab. Might not mean much to us today with our life insurance policies and government support, etc. here, but in that day that was consigned to a miserable life. First of all, you weren't among your own family, Naomi wasn't. She's in a foreign country under pagan rule and pagan systems. She has no husband to support her. And of course, she has no sons who will take care of her. Desperate situation. And so she has these two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, who had married her sons. All three now widows. And Naomi heads back to the only hope that she feels she can have, back to her family members in Bethlehem. She counsels her daughters-in-law to stay there in Moab, the place they knew and grew up. But Ruth shows loyalty to Naomi and to Naomi's God because she had turned her back on her false gods of Moab, Chemosh, was the God they worship. To worship the one true God of Israel. She pledges allegiance. You see that there in chapter 1. To Yahweh, not to the God of Moab, Chemosh. It's an amazing act of faith and risk here. And what results from this day and this time and this decision comes through insisting that she is willing to forsake all that she knew of her old life and follow the covenant-keeping God of Israel. And so the story of Ruth is really written through Naomi's eyes and perspective. She's the key eyewitness to this. Naomi is kind of like a female Job in this story. She has suffered. The rug has been pulled out from under her. She wonders, does God care? And what happens in the unfolding in this book here is you see a man of noble character, he's even called that, and then a woman of noble character. And then a time of joy and birth, and then there's an epilogue and a prologue at the end of this four chapter story. Ruth goes back to settle in Bethlehem, Bethlehem, of all places. Nothing. A nothing town. Nothing village. Insignificant. Means house of bread. Probably because of the crops that they would harvest there. It's a grain growing area. And what happens is Ruth becomes known throughout the region. Even as a Moabite. There in Israel. An immigrant. A stranger. For her faithfulness and trust in the God of Israel. Look at chapter 2 and verse 11. The scripture, Boaz, when he encounters Ruth, he answered and said to her, It has been fully, it has fully been showed me all that you have done to your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your nativity, and are come to a people which you knew not before. Reputation goes out. See what happens was that when Naomi and Ruth moved to move into Bethlehem, uh, Naomi says, You know what? There's a relative of mine here. And there was a law there in Israel, you can read about this in Deuteronomy, that um, 
if, uh, if someone was a widow, their next closest relative was to marry that uh, uh, sister-in-law, cousin, however it would work there, in order to perpetuate the family line. And Naomi sees a glimpse of hope, and she says, in planning to Ruth here, he says, go to his fields. He's out reaping. And there was a custom of the day, and actually a command by the Lord, that those who had fields were to um, uh, leave the corners uncut and the edges of the field so that the poor could <laughs> gather food. Ruth takes advantage of that. And there's a buzz about this Moabite woman in the field. Boaz finds out he wants to know more, more about her. He gets some reports. He learns how noble character she has. He's gleaning barley. This Boaz guy is what's called a kinsman redeemer. A person who'd marry a widow in order to preserve the family line. And in chapter 2 and verse 20, the scripture says, when Ruth reports back where she had gleaned, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who has not left off his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, The man is near of kin to us, one of our next kinsmen. Naomi now can begin to see. She zooms out a little bit from the details of life here. She begin, can, can begin to see what she thought was unlikely. God cares for her, a widow, and her family. And what she doesn't know is what we know because we've read the whole book. And by that I mean the whole Bible. It was bigger than that. God is working to crush the head of the serpent and send a forever king from the future seed of David. And Naomi has no idea that their lives are going to play a part in that. And so you have this man of noble character, Boaz, who looks kindly upon Ruth. And then you have a woman of noble character, uh, Ruth, here. And by the way, the Jewish scriptures play the place the book of Ruth after Proverbs. In the canon, the scripture. What do you know about the last chapter of Proverbs? The virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, and that's the intent of placing Ruth after Proverbs 31. <clears throat> this woman of noble character, in fact, the very same word translated virtuous there uh, in, in Proverbs 31 of the virtuous woman is used here to speak of Ruth and Boaz. And Naomi, Naomi and Ruth, they hatch up this plan here to get Boaz to notice Ruth. And going to Boaz, Ruth asks Boaz to redeem her family and marry her. Boaz notices her noble character, and he agrees, but he says there's this problem here. There's someone who is a closer relative to you guys than me. And so, by law, he's the one who's supposed to take care of this. And so let's go do our due diligence and say, hey, here's what you're supposed to do. And that's the risk we're going to take. And so they go to this guy, and he's like, yeah, I... I have a responsibility to do this, and I would also have this inheritance. And then, he's, and then Boaz says, don't forget about this. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, that would kind of cramp my life a little bit here. And he says, uh, yeah, I'm going to back out of that. I'm going to hand that over to you, Boaz. And Boaz redeems the family. He rescues the family in a certain sense. He marries Ruth. The family line is extended. The care and financial stability. Your day and our day, when we want people to know who we are and what we do, we kind of give them our resume. I've worked here, I've lived here, I've done this, I've accomplished this, I've done that. The resume is an Israelite, an Israelite culture, and the Eastern culture was your family tree. Here's my, here's my resume. My 
husbands died. We were in Moab. My daughter's married two Moabite men, and they're dead, and we're coming back home now. How's that for a resume and a life of standing in your village? Boaz changes that. There's honor. Ruth and Naomi celebrate. And then, in chapter 4, here after this happens, Boaz, of course, mirrors Ruth's act of loyalty to Naomi and coming to her God. And he marries Ruth in the presence of the city elders. And their marriage produces joy and birth, becomes a lineage of King David from whom the Messiah would come. Josh read chapter 4, verses 9 through the end there. Boaz said to the elders and to all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. That the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place, you are witnesses this day. And they say, we're witnesses. The Lord do this. The Lord make the woman that has come into your house, 411, like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. You see again that theme here of, of the line, the, 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 the uh, continual descendants here. And do you worthily in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem, and let your house be like the house of Perez. Well, who's Perez? Remember two weeks ago, Judah and Tamar. Perez came from Tamar. Remember that whole situation and story, and how God preserved the line through an unlikely way. Which Tamar bore to Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give you of this young woman. You can see the hope there. And Boaz. And Ruth are married, and they have a child. In verse 14, And the women said to Naomi, Blessed be Yahweh, which has not left you this day without a kinsman, a kinsman redeemer, that his name may be famous in Israel, and he shall be to you a restorer of your life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law, which loves you which is better to you than seven sons. Well, the woman said amen, right? <laughs> That's born. Here's Grandma Naomi. She takes this child and she holds him close. See what this child represented? She became the nurse to this child she cares, Grandma cares for this child. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, Obed the name, saying, there's a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David. And then the author of Ruth, we don't know who he is, but he must have been alive during the time of David, because he's wanting to establish this story here in connection to David probably in connection to God's covenant he makes to David in 2 Samuel 7, says, these are the generations of Pharez. Who's Pharez? It's already been mentioned here. Remember who he was? He's from who? What woman? Tamar. He starts there. Why there? Why not go back further? Why there? Because Pharez was the first descendant here of the Judah line, from Judah here, through which this now string, this line would become more narrow and specific. David. Pharaoh's father, Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon. Wait, what do you know about Salmon? From last Sunday. Who's his wife? Rahab, the Amorite, from Jericho. That's not how it's supposed to work, God, right? And Salmon's son was who? 
Who's Boaz's mom? Boaz fathers Obed. The Ruth, Obed fathers Jesse and Jesse father David. So the book of Ruth ends with this genealogy. It shows how this Moabite widow, a group of people, a nation under God's curse, becomes the great grandmother of King David. And we see God's saving purposes for the entire nation brought about through simple faith. And before when I would read Ruth, I would say, oh, that's such a nice story. A little naive. Oh, a nice love story. Oh, see, God takes someone and he makes it all good again. Part of it. This book here, you know, for the reader today, when God gives us the word, he wants us to take ownership of the word. It's easy when you teach the New Testament epistles and here's what God's done and here's the commands he gives to live out of that, right? It could be simple and clear here. But you get to a story and you got to stop. you got to think about it. you got to see the details that the narrator is putting in there. The scene he's setting up here. And this book here opens a window as we sit here in the 21st century into what God is doing through all these things behind the scenes. And we don't always have that privilege to see exactly what he's doing. Sometimes we just see details. But we are told that he's always working. And the story of Ruth zooms in on the details and then zooms back out and says, and this is what God was doing all along. Now, when you and I are caught up in the details of life, we're only seeing this forest, right? The trees. And we may not see the expanse of it till eternity. But what we are assured of is that God is doing something really big and significant. Whether we can see it here or now, not. Now as you get older, you can look back upon your life and start to see more of those details and how they're under the hand of God. Ruth and Boaz, loyalty in this Scriptures here, Boaz to uh, his Lord and then to his, his kinsmen and Ruth to Naomi and Naomi's God. And they display a loyalty that the God of Israel has to his covenant promise with Abraham of a nation and a descendant through whom all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. That the Lord will complete his mission. He will be faithful. And he uses very ordinary and unlikely people to do so, who are obedient and loyal to him. He uses that, he honors that, he blesses that. And even when they aren't, he does. And here in this story here, God uses a faithful non-Israelite to bring restoration to his people. Think about the irony of this. A faithful Moabitess? A faithful woman from Moab? Who marries into the house of Judah? The funny thing about it is, back in the story of Balaam, in Numbers 24 and verse 17, God had said this through Balaam in Moab. He said this, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And listen to this. And shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Balaam, this pagan prophet God uses, can't even control his mouth. <laughs> he just has to utter blessings and curses upon his own people. Says, God's going to raise someone up, a descendant, a seed, who's going to strike down Moab. Guess what? It did happen. But guess what? God still includes a Moabitess in this, in this covenant of love. <laughs> There's many similar similarities to the story of Tamar in Genesis 38, the need for a descendant, a son, because there is a same God at work in both events. That's what we see in Matthew 1, when these four women 
Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba are mentioned in Jesus' Jesus family tree, genealogy. It's mysterious in how he does it, but he's working. And this story here just shows more and more evidence of God's hand in seeming unlikely ways and very ordinary ways through human relationships and circumstances through life. And he does this all through Scripture, and especially 1,300 years later from this story in Bethlehem again of all places. To unlikely, ordinary people in obscurity. And this genealogy at the end says, push the zoom out button. How many of you have ever used Google Maps or a program like that and you zoom in an address there and then you zoom out and you start to see where that road is in conjunction with the rest of the town and where the town is in conjunction with the rest of the state, where the state is in conjunction with the rest of the country. And if you really push that button, you'd actually zoom out on Google Earth and see the planet. <laughs> That's what this genealogy at the end is doing. It's making a final link between a story no one would really know if it were not told. And the birth of David. This genealogy shows us God's big story and where this little story goes down the path of the birth of David, the king of Israel, and the story of the birth of the son of David, eventually the Messiah, the redeemer, the ascended king, the true kinsman redeemer. And I want you to see this. There's a reason that the, that the apostles in the declaration of the gospel would say Jesus descended from David. This is no accident. And in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul says, A servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, and then he will explain the gospel in these ways. The good news of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. It's something you can read very quickly and say, yeah, okay, he sent from David. Until you see the book of Ruth. Until you see Tamar. Until you see Rahab. Bathsheba. And so on. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. That's our God. That's what he does through Ruth. That's what he does. That's what he accomplishes. And so this book of Ruth is a beautifully crafted look about how God's good purpose interplays here with the human elements. Human decisions. It's a story certainly of love and loss, but faithfulness and redemption. Now, God is at work in the ordinary and mundane details of life. That God's people experience Hard circumstances, trials, difficulties in this life. And through God's work and through people, and even the kindnesses of people, Ruth is a tremendous friend. You want to know what friendship is? Study what God does through friendship with Ruth. Shows that we can experience his sovereignty, his wisdom, his loyal love. So where's this all going for you and I today? First of all, I want to just remind us that that's not the first question that we ask when we approach a text. The first question is, what does this show us about our God? And we understand that. Then we can say, Lord, how does my life correspond to this? How has your life been woven into God's big story? You see, there's a temptation to just look at our life as that one tree. Disconnected. Friends, we are very tiny. Our lives have been woven in through Christ. Through this descended seed. Into the bigger story of God's plan. 
Here's a Gentile and Ruth, and here's a room full of Gentiles. It doesn't really mean much to us today because Gentiles are all we know. We didn't grow up around the Commonwealth of Israel and the things that we are separated from. But God's made one new man through Christ. How is God using people and circumstances in ways that work for his big plan? Most of us don't really stop and think about it in the middle of it. But what are the jobs that you've taken? Places you've lived? Marriages? Friendships? Tragedies? Sicknesses? Health? Other people's choices that affected you? Remember, my, my dad, uh, my parents will be married um, tomorrow, 40, 44 years. Yeah, 44 years tomorrow. And um, my dad saw, was a junior at Bible college, saw my mom as a freshman, and wanted to um, take her on a date. And he uh, asked his friend, hey, what's that girl's name? And the guy said, oh, her, that's so-and-so. And, -so. and um, so my dad looked up her name and called her and asked if he could go on a date with her. And so they did, and the girl, he called, got there, and it was the wrong girl. Some of his friend had given him the wrong name. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, um, he didn't tell her. He didn't say, hey, you're the wrong girl. <laughs> Went through the date. <clears throat> Went home, and he's like, that wasn't the girl. It was a friend or roommate. He's like, oh, I thought you meant so-and-so. No, I meant that. And he was like, ah, oh, forget that. You know, I was just going to give up on that. And someone said, try again, ball through. <laughs> and so he uh, got in contact with the right girl, my mom now. Of course, the rest is history. <laughs> I think of the story of a young girl at the beginning of the, or the early years of the uh, 20th century, 1900s, who very poor and went and worked in a single man's home as like a caretaker, like a, like a servant maid. At the age of 14, her and this man had a relationship, illicit. They had a son born out of that relationship. And then his sister, and a girl born out of that. The man was an atheist, cared little about God, even discussing it, of course. The girl maybe knew some things about God. And then a neighbor started showing interest in this girl. This neighbor then started talking to her about the Lord. This girl took her two little children and there they came to Christ through this neighbor. And that little boy, the illegitimate child, grew up knowing God. He became a pastor as he grew up later. He married a girl who Parents had just come over from Scotland and Norfolk, Virginia, to work in the shipyard. Shipped out to World War II, came back, survived, came back, started their family, began pastoral ministry. They had a daughter, and then a son, daughter, a few miscarriages along the way. And then that guy is the one who met my mom. Little decisions, things like that along the way. God using people's faithfulness. God working despite people's unfaithfulness. I want you to look back and look back on your life. Zoom out a little bit. Car accidents, sicknesses, tragedies, difficulties. Where do you see the hand of God working? To weave you into God's big story here. 
of his mission to bring a redeemed people into the presence of the Lamb of God forever. How is he using people and circumstances and ways that works for his big plan? How has he shown you that he is the grand chess master? He puts his pieces here, and you move your pieces. But he's got a plan. To bring us to God. To show the world and display through our lives that we have a great, sovereign, wise, faithful, loving king. Maybe you're here today and you're in the midst of something that's very difficult and you're struggling to believe there's a purpose in the story. And I'm here to tell you when you zoom out, though you might not see it in this day even before you die, you will see that there is a purpose in the story he's writing. And it's not bland. And it's not ambiguous. It is very clear. It's the exaltation of the crucified and risen King in your life, in our lives together. At the same time, I also want to warn you. There are decisions and hardening of hearts and walking away from the faithfulness of God that lead to destructive outcomes. I think of Ruth's life if she had not that day said, your God is my God. And she went back to Moab. A life without knowing the one true God. And I want to remind you today, if you do not know the Lord, this God, he has been extremely kind and generous to put you in settings like this, and the hearing of the word of God and families and connections with people who know God because he wants you to turn to him. He's poured out his grace. He's done everything that is necessary to give you the one true and only way back to God through the Son, Jesus Christ. Through Christ, who, descend, who, who, who always existed, descended to earth here as we celebrate this Christmas time in flesh, God in flesh, lived perfectly faithful his whole life, died as an innocent Jewish rabbi to take the sins that you've committed upon him. Rose victorious, ascended as the enthroned king, and he's offering you all that he is. And he's asking you for all that you are. <clears throat> and he makes that clump of clay and he forms and fashions it into something used for his glory that shows the world that he is the true king. But there's a responsibility you have. You have to leave Moab. You have to say, that is my God. Where he goes, I will go. Where he leads, I will follow. God asks you to give him everything. Because God has made the way where he has given everything. And so... That happens through a trust, a reliance that what God has done as he did to Ruth, he has done for you in Christ. I'm going to say goodbye to that. My old life under destruction and I'm coming to Jesus and I'm resting upon him. Scripture Scriptural terms is repent and believe. Turn and trust. And Jesus says, any man who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Come to Jesus. Let's pray. 
Lord, there's lots of ways that we really struggle to believe that there's a big story that you're, that you're writing that you have woven us into. Lord, thank you for this story of Ruth as told through the eyes of Naomi. You restored a woman who said her life is nothing but bitterness by the circumstances that have gone on. And at the end, she's holding a grandson in her arms. Thank you that you're using ordinary people as being joined to you to be the snake crushers in your big plan. Thank you, Lord, that we can't outwit you. Thank you for taking us to the end of ourselves, showing us how good you are. Lord, as we sing, I pray that we would sing in true adoration, true worship to you, in awe. We sing songs that we're really familiar with, Christmas songs and stories of redemption. That would we rejoice that when Jesus said, whosoever, he included me. He included us. And Lord, I pray if there's one who is pushing against this faithful love of God and his offering, pray that they may not rest until they have personally and individually placed their full trust in the God of Ruth. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh, thank you, Charles. Appreciate that. Thank you, Church. Appreciate that. I was not <laughs> was not expecting that at the end of my sermon here. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you so much. You.